NBC presents short story. Tonight, Sherwood Anderson. Sherwood Anderson wrote of the American small town with skill and devotion. His book, Winesburg, Ohio, is a classic of its kind. He wrote also of boyhood, of the most deeply felt emotions of adolescence at the moment of their disenchantment. Tonight, two stories of an American boy and how, for him, the world became a little less shining. The stories, I want to know why, and I'm a fool. But first, a brief message from the United States Marine Corps. Born of necessity, forged by experience, shaped by destiny. That is the United States Marine Corps. Since 1775, when the original company of Continental Marines was organized in Philadelphia, the Marines have stood ready to defend their country's honor. Actually, the history of America is the history of the Marine Corps. For as our flag traveled around the globe in defense of freedom, the Marines were on hand to help ensure that freedom. Down through the years, the motto, Semper Fidelis, always faithful, has become a lasting creed. To the Marine, it's more than a motto. It's a way of life. For the Marine is proud of his corps, proud of its glorious achievements, proud of its great traditions. And that's why each Marine has such tremendous confidence in himself and in his corps. And that's why the American people have come to have such confidence in their United States Marines. And now, the Sherwood Anderson short stories, I Want to Know Why and I'm a Fool. The reason I'm writing this story is I want to know why something happened to me. I'm puzzled. I'm getting to be a man and I want to think straight and be okay. And Well, there's something I saw at the race meeting at Saratoga I can't figure out. How did I happen to be in Saratoga, me a kid of 15? Well, it was like this. One evening in my hometown of Beckersville, Kentucky, I was talking to some friends of mine. You're crazy. If they caught us, our folks would skin us alive. And how'd we ever get all the way to Saratoga? We ain't got any money. Don't be dumb. What are freight trains for? What's the matter, Turner? Scared? Heck no, but that's a long way. I only got a buck. Tom's only got two. Well, how about you, Henry? Well, I got $11 saved myself. And I got $37. We'll get along. Now, listen. The spring meets in Kentucky are over this week, and everybody's cutting out for the east. Sounds good to me. This old town's plenty dead when the races are over. I'm for following the fun where it goes. There, you see what Henry says? Boy, just wait till you get to Saratoga. They've got the prettiest horse flesh in the world up there. That's what they say anyway. Yes, sir. That's what they say. You see, I can't help it. I'm crazy about thoroughbred horses. I've always been that way. When I was ten years old and saw I was growing to be big and couldn't be a rider, I almost died. Tried smoking cigars, everything to stunt my growth. Of course, I kept on growing. Then I wanted to be a stable boy, but mostly colored boys did that work. So finally, I just had to be satisfied by being around horses. If you've never been crazy about thoroughbreds, it's because you've never been around them much and don't know any better. They're beautiful. There isn't anything so lovely and clean and full of spunk and honest and everything is some resources. So that's why I want to know why, if anybody could love horses the way I do, how could this thing happen at Saratoga? But I'm getting ahead of my story. How much longer we got to hop these freights? I'm dead. (sighs) So am I. We're almost there. An hour yet. Maybe less. Anyway, we can get a good night's sleep in Saratoga. Bill Dad can put us up and give us a feed of fried chicken besides. Bill Dad in Saratoga? Why didn't you say so before? Oh, what good would it have done? Sure, Bill Dad's there. But there's a horse race. You'll always find that old stable boy. I wish I was Bill Dad. You're crazy. Yeah, I wish I was Bill Dad. He's lucky. He can follow the tracks. Maybe it's a foolish thing to say, but that's the way I am about being around horses. Just crazy. I can't help it. Now, you boys ain't going to quit on old Bill Dad now, is you? Take another glass of milk, son. Oh, we're busting, Bill Dad. Mm-mm. What a mess of food. Another plate of chicken wings and legs over there. 
I don't want to see it go to waste now, so... Uh, mm, it's you... coming out of our ears, Bill, Dad. Well, I expect you boys want to turn in, then. It'll come a mighty far piece. All the way from Kentucky to New York. Ah, you said it. Where do we hit the hay? Uh, I expect you'll be doing just that. Yes, sir. Uh, there's a loft a couple of shares down the way there. Just pull the hay over you and you'll see it just fine. Bill, Dad, you won't squeal on us, will you? Squeal? Squeal on you? I mean to our folks. We don't want them to know where we are. Or anything. What do you mean, Henry, asking a question like that? Bill, that square with kids. You can trust him. Thank you, son. Thank you. Now you get a good night uh, rest and don't worry none. And tomorrow? Well, you ain't traveled a thousand miles for nothing, son. Why? Tomorrow you're going to see a horse race that is a horse race. The Melford Handicap with Middlestride running against Sunstreak. Middlestride in Sunstreak? Yes, sirree. Two of the finest horses ever come out of Kentucky. Bill, Dad, which one of them's going to win? <laughs> How does I know which one's going to win? That's foolish talk, boy. How would anybody know that? Oh, I would, Bill, Dad, if I could only see him. Bill, Dad, do you think you could get us into the paddock tomorrow so I could just see him before they run? Son, you'd better not do that. Uh, Mr. Jerry Tilford, Sunstreak's trainer, he's a back home boy. If he sees you, he'll know you done run away, and he'll send you right back to Beckersville. Well, maybe he won't see me. And I can't help it, Bill, Dad. I've just got to see those horses tomorrow. I couldn't sleep that night. Like I told you before, it brings a lump into my throat when a horse runs. I don't mean all horses, but some. I can pick them every time. It's in my blood. I can tell a winner. If my throat burns and it's hard for me to swallow, then I know that's him, a winner. And both these horses were the kind that make my throat hurt. Sunstreak or Middlestride? I just had to know the answer. At Saratoga, they saddled the horses right out in an open place under trees on a lawn as smooth and nice as Banker Bowen's front yard back in Beckersville. Oh, it's lovely. The horses are sweaty and nervous and shine, and the men come out and smoke cigars and look at them, and your heart thumps so you can hardly breathe. At the risk of being seen and caught, I went there to see him saddled. The other boys didn't dare, but I did. I had to see Middlestride and Sunstreet. Well, what do you think of Middlestride, son? Is he going to win? Uh, I don't know, Bill, Dad. I can't tell yet. Not till I see Sunstreak. Well, here he comes now. Son, take a look at a horse. Oh. What did our Bill Dad tell you? Sunstreak. He's beautiful. Yes, sirree. And it's like I say, you ain't traveled a thousand miles for nothing, son. Oh, no. Who you got there, Bill Dad? Oh, oh, watch out, son. It's... Uh... Jerry. Jerry Tilford. Well, I thought I recognized you, boy. Aren't you from back home in Beckersville? Y yes, sir. A long way from home, aren't you, son? Yes, sir. I came up to see the races. Thought your father didn't like you to follow the races. No, sir. Did you know you're here? Well, I... Oh, Mr. Tilford, you aren't gonna... Gonna tell him, are you? No. <laughs> really like the horses, don't you, kid? Yes, sir. And you're looking at one right now. Sunstreak. That's a real thoroughbred, son. And then I knew the trainer wasn't going to give me away. I kept standing, looking at that horse, and aching all over. In some way, I can't tell how, I knew just how Sunstreak felt inside. He was very quiet. But I could tell that horse was like a raging torrent inside. That horse wasn't thinking about running. He was just thinking about holding himself back till the time for the running came. He was going to do some awful running that afternoon, and I knew it. I knew it, and Jerry knew it, too. Because when I looked up, I saw that shine in his eye. The same as I saw in Sunstreaks. How could he lose, eh, kid? How could he lose the way he's feeling inside? Jerry, you know it too. Yeah, yeah. That's my horse, kid. I raised him from a colt and sweated and worked myself to death over him. <laughs> but he's worth it, isn't he? <laughs> isn't that the sweetest horse you ever saw in your life? He's like a girl. Like a girl you think about sometimes, but never see. So lovely and smooth. Yeah, I know. Look at him, kid. He's the greatest thing in the world.
nobody ever felt the way we did at that moment. Jerry and Sunstreak and me. That's all there was. There was nothing better in the whole wide world. Then I came away to the fence to watch the race. I watched the race calm because I knew what would happen. I was sure. Come on, Sensory! Show them your heels! Henry and Tom and Turner were all more excited than me. Because a funny thing had happened to me. All through the race, I was thinking about Jerry Tilford and how happy he was. I liked him that afternoon even more than I liked my father. I knew that for him it was like a mother seeing her child do something brave or wonderful. Yes, everything came out just as I expected. Sunstreak busted the world's record for a mile. I've seen that if I've never seen anything. After the race, I cut out from Tom and Henry and Turner. I wanted to be by myself, and, and I wanted to be near Jerry Tilford if I could work it. It was the first time I ever felt for a man like that. And then... Well, here's what happened. And I want to know why it happened. I had seen Jerry start out in a car with some men down the road leading to the edge of town. I took a shortcut and came out just a little ahead of where the car stopped. What I saw and heard gave me the fantods. Well, here's the farmhouse, boys. Pile out. Uh, I uh, I don't think I'll stay, Jerry. <coughs> Been a long day, and, well, it's only a short walk back to the hotel. Oh, uh, don't be a wet blanket, Reback. Went to a lot of trouble to fix up these dates. Now, come on. Is that you, Jerry? Just a minute, Molly. Don't keep us waiting all night. we got to celebrate your victory, honey. Well, Reba, how about it? I'm bidding you men good night. See you tomorrow. Good night. <laughs> well, how do you like that? All right, what are we waiting for? Those women on the porch of that house were all ugly, mean-looking women. They were homely, too, except one who was tall and looked a little like Middlestride, but not clean like him, but with a hard, ugly mouth. <laughs> I looked at Jerry Tilford. I've told you how I've been feeling about him on account of his knowing what was going on inside of Sun Street. I listened to Jerry brag in that loud voice that didn't seem to be his at all. <laughs> yes, sir, Molly, I made that horse. That horse didn't win the race today. I won it. I made that world's record. <laughs> yes, he I lied and it. bragged like a fool. <laughs> I never heard such silly talk. And then, what do you suppose he did? He looked at the women in there, that tall, rotten, hard-mouthed woman. <laughs> Come on now, baby. Give us a kiss. And I saw that shine in his eye. That same shine I'd seen that afternoon when he looked at me in Sunstreak. <laughs> And all of a sudden, I began to hate that man. I wanted to scream and rush in the porch and kill him. I was so mad clean through that I cried, and my fists were doubled up so my fingernails cut my hands. But Jerry's eyes kept shining. I've been thinking about that night ever since. I can't make it out. I'm 16 now and go to the tracks every chance I can, same as before... But things are different. At the tracks, the air don't taste as good or smell as good. It's because a man like Jerry Tilford, who knows what he does, could see a horse like Sunstreak run and then kiss a woman like that the same day. I can't make it out. Darn him, I keep thinking about it, and it spoils looking at horses and enjoying life and everything. Sometimes I'm so mad about it, I want to fight someone. It gives me the fantods. What did he do it for? I want to know why. I was 19 before I got over my disillusionment about Jerry. That was when I fell in love with the most wonderful girl in the world. But that got all mixed up, too. I'm a fool. It all started with a conversation I had with my mother. Your father and I have been very patient with you, son. But you're a man now, and you've got to do a man's work. I know what you're going to say, Mom. I want you to promise me you'll give up racehorses. You don't know what you're asking me to do. Horses are all I know. Yes, that's been your education. 
Table boys, roustabouts, gamblers, goodness knows what all. They've been your companions. Promise me you'll say goodbye to all that. You'll break my heart. That's what you'll do. Okay, Mom. All right, I promise. No more racehorses. There's a lot of things you got to promise a mother because she don't know any better. Well, anyhow, I saw that I had to get out of town so that I wouldn't be on me all the time and so as I wouldn't break her heart. I went to Sandusky, Ohio and got a job taking care of horses for a man in the storage and coal business. Those horses couldn't have trotted a t- race with a toad. Well, I was keeping my promise after all and sending money home. But one day I ran into an old friend. Bill, Dad! What in the world are you doing in Sandusky? What do you mean, boy? What am I doing here? The fall raises, son. The fall raising season's done begun. Yeah, of course. Now, don't tell me you just thought of that, son. As a matter of fact, I hadn't given him a thought till just this minute, Bill, Dad. Hey, you was going to be at tomorrow when the first race is run. Sure you is. Just like old times. Tomorrow, huh? That's my day off, I might... I've sworn off, but... My, my. You sure have grown up, ain't you? You'll be a dude at the track, boy. A regular dude. The next day, I drew my $40, dressed in my good clothes and brown derby hat, and prepared to put on the dog. I strolled into the West House, the big hotel, and stopped by the tobacco counter. Yeah, what's yours? Uh, give me three 25-cent cigars. Yes, sir. Right from Havana. Here you are, sir. Oh, and uh, one more thing. Where's the tavern room? You're practically falling into it, son. Right at your elbow. Oh. Oh, thank you very much. There was a big crowd of horsemen and strangers and dressed-up people milling through the tavern room. I fought my way to a place beside a fellow with a cane and a Windsor tie. I like a man to be a man and dress up, but not to put on that kind of airs. I nudged him aside. (coughs) I beg your pardon? Yeah? What for? What's yours, son? Oh, uh, uh, some of that on the second shelf. Eh? How you have it? Water or neat? Uh, neat, of course. <laughs> That's pretty strong stuff, my friend. Another one. Neat. Without water. Going to the races, son? Well, aren't we all? Oh, excuse me, my hack is waiting. Don't want to miss the first race. <laughs> When I got to the races, I bought the best seat in the grandstand. And there I was, gay as you please, watching the stable swipes down below. Same as I'd been a year before. I was feeling good. (laughs) Well, right in front of me in the grandstand that day was a fellow with a couple of girls about my age. And one of the girls was the prettiest girl I've ever seen in all my life. (laughs) What are you laughing at, Lucy? Oh, you just seem so positive about winning on that horse, Wilbur. You're so funny when you get serious. You're a fine sister. I think you'd back me up. Eleanor does. (laughs) Well, Eleanor's stuck on you. I'm not. Don't say things like that. You're making her blush. (laughs) Eleanor, where are you going? Eleanor! Now you've chased her away. Oh, she'll be back. Maybe she's going to place a bet herself. On your about Ben Adheim. Abu Ben Adam is the correct name of that horse. Abu Ben Adam may his tribe increase. That one? <laughs> what a dumb name for a horse. I couldn't keep still any longer. She was the most irresistible girl I've ever seen, and she was this boy's sister. And Lucy's brother was about to lose his money on a horse I knew something about. Well, I couldn't let that happen. I said, I beg your pardon. What? Abu Ben Adam is a fine horse, all right. He's sure to win. But you've got to bet him right. Yeah? How do you mean? Got a hot tip or something? Hot tip? Well, I like that. I happen to know that horse very well. You do? How come? (laughs) He's probably the son of the owner of Abu Ben Adam. Uh, (laughs) That's right. My name is... uh... Not Walter Mather, Jr. Yeah, yeah, but uh, call me Walter. Well, it turned out their names were Wilbur and Lucy Wesson. And Wilbur made the fat man who had the seat next to Lucy trade with me. And before you could say Jack Robinson, we were talking along like very old friends. But wait a minute, Walter. You said just now I could win on that horse if I knew how to bet him. Oh, sure. Don't bet a cent on this first heat because he'll go like an oxen hitched to a plow. 
but when the first eat is over, go right down and lay on your pile. Gee whiz, I'm sure glad we'd run into you. And I'll join you, Wilbur. When you place that bed of yours, slap this 30 of mine on a boo Ben Adam. Oh, you must lead a marvelous life, Walter. Me? Why? Well, Walter Mather's son must lead the life of, of Rockefeller. I wouldn't say that exactly. Tell us about your estate, Walt. Uh... I can just picture that house of yours. A big brick one, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Rolling hills, stables... You... Uh, you must have seen it. Yes, we did once, from a distance, but not up close. Oh, you must come and visit us. Oh, really? Could we? Any time, of course. Oh, gee. They're about to begin. Look! I was glad to look away because of what I'd drunk in the tavern. What I wouldn't have given for a stick of chewing gum or a lozenge or some licorice. Or almost anything to kill my breath. But Lucy didn't seem to notice. She was too nice and too well-bred. Imagine me, a four-flusher with a wonderful girl like that, taking me at my word for the son of Walter Mayfield. Why, you were right, Walter. Huh? That horse went off his stride in the first heat just like you said he would. Now we'll put up the bets, huh? Oh, and wait a minute, Wilbur. Eleanor and I want to bet $10 apiece. $10 apiece? Oh, now, you don't want to take a chance like that. We don't want to miss a chance like this. And we've got the inside word on who's going to win from the horse's mouth itself. (laughs) Oh, I don't mean you, Walter. (laughs) I felt sick. I tell you, I felt sick. But I was to get sicker later. About the gilding of Boo Ben Adam and their winning their money, I wasn't worried a lot about that. It came out okay. That horse stepped the next three heats like a bushel of spoiled eggs going to market before they could be found out. And Wilbur Weston and the girls got nine to two for their money. Now, there was something else eating at me. Well, now that we've won all this money, the four of us are going out together. And I'm going to spend a little on our good friend, Walter Mather. Well, I don't know. Oh, of course you're going to be our guest. We'll hire a hack from here, go to the hotel, have champagne, dinner and dance. How can you refuse, Walter? Walter, I'm having the most divine evening. Where in the world did you learn to dance like this? Anybody could dance with a girl like you, Lucy. Oh, Walter. Only, there isn't another girl like you. More, please. Just let me look for a minute. You know, I wish you weren't Walter Mather, Jr. What? I mean, you're so lofty. I wish you were just nobody. Suppose I was. Nobody. Nobody. Oh, I couldn't possibly like you anymore if you were... There was my chance to square myself. Lucy didn't really care who I was. There's the kind of a girl you see just once in your life, and if you don't get busy and make hay, then you're gone for good and all, and you might as well go jump off a bridge. They give you a look from inside of them somewhere, and it it ain't no vamping, and what it means is... You want that girl to be your wife. And you want nice things around her like flowers and swell clothes. And you want her to have the kids you're going to have. And you want good music played and no ragtime and... Oh, gee whiz. But somehow I couldn't tell her just then. Come on, you two. That's the last number. You gonna dance all night? I'd like to. Me too, Lucy. I tell you what. Our train doesn't leave for another couple of hours. There's a place across the bay, Cedar Point. We can hire a launch and take a ride in the moonlight. And then you can see us to the train, Walter. We can be together right up to the time the train leaves. Cedar Point, huh? Where's that launch, Wilbur? While we were in the launch, Lucy didn't talk hardly at all, and neither did I. And I was thinking how glad I was my mother was all right and always made us kids learn to eat with a fork at the table and not swill soup and not be noisy and rough like a gang you see around a racetrack that way. Walter? Yes, Lucy? Walter, see that tree sticking up from the water? It has some sort of blossoms on it. Oh, don't they smell sweet? Mm, Wonderful. Oh, Walter, this night is perfect. Well, it's, it's so warm and soft and sweet. Like... Like an orange. Oh, that's beautiful, Walter. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we've got to get back to that train. Walter. Yes? Kiss me, Walter. Once here, before we get to the depot. Will I? Oh, Walter, 
It's as if I could get out of the boat with you and walk on the water. And I guess that sounded foolish. But I knew what she meant. And then quick we were at the depot and there was a big gang of yaps, the kind that goes to fairs and crowding and milling around like cattle. And how could I tell her? I... I guess this is goodbye, Walter. For a little while only, I hope. It won't be long, Lucy, because I'll write and you'll write. I'll send you my address. I have yours, of course. Everybody knows where Walter Mather lives. Goodbye, Walter. Come on, Lucy. The train's leaving. Lucy, wait a minute. I've got to tell you something. Save it for a letter. Goodbye, Walter. Until we meet. Lucy. Lucy, where can I write you? I don't know. You've got to tell me. Lucy. Lucy. Maybe Lucy would write me down at Walter Mather's, and the letter would come back and stamped on the front of it by the USA, there ain't any such guy, or whatever they stamp on a letter like that. Me, trying to pass myself off for a big bug and a swell, to her, as decent a little body as God ever made. Oh, gee, I could have run after that train and made Dan Patch look like a freight train after a wreck, but socks a mighty, what was the use? Did you ever see such a fool? I'll bet you what. If I had an arm broke right now or a train had run over my foot, I wouldn't go to no doctor at all. I'd go sit down and let her hurt and hurt. That's what I'd do. I wish I had that fellow with a cane and the Windsor tie in the tavern room. I'd smash him for fair. Gosh darn his eyes. He's a big fool, that's what he is. And if I'm not another, you just go find me one and I'll quit working and be a bum and give him my job. I don't care nothing for working and earning money and saving it for no such boob as myself. I'm a fool. I want to know why, and I'm a fool. Two short stories by Sherwood Anderson, adapted for radio by William Hodap. In tonight's cast, the boy was Jerry Farber. Turner was Michael Miller. Henry was Joel Nestler. Bildad was Felix Nelson. Jerry was Lamont Johnson. Mr. Reback was Junius Matthews. A woman was Anne Diamond. The mother was Gloria Ann Simpson. A man, Robert O'Connor. Wilbur was Charles Smith. Lucy was Gloria Grant. Your announcer, Don Stanley. The director of NBC Presents Short Story is Andrew C. Love. Be with us again next week at the same time as NBC presents Short Story. On that occasion, a short story of the dark world of the insane and of several people who tried to bring light into it. The story, Keys, by H.D. Boylston. That's a week from tonight. And in the meantime, bear in mind this message from the United States Marine Corps. The United States Marine Corps is considered by many to be the finest military organization in the world. This reputation is based on three principal elements. The first is training, thorough training in the newest military techniques. The second is teamwork. On land, sea, and in the air, Marines operate as a team. And finally, a most important factor, esprit de corps, the loyalty Marines feel for each other and the pride of service for which they are world famous. And a natural outgrowth of pride is confidence. When men have confidence in themselves, their comrades, and their leaders... They become welded into an unbeatable team. Training, teamwork, and pride of outfit. These are the vital ingredients of any outstanding military organization. And they are the foundations upon which the United States Marines have built their long and glorious record. NBC Presents Short Story came to you from Hollywood's Radio City. This is NBC, the national broadcasting...